Hello and welcome to this evening's science and conservation event from the Zoological Society of London. My name is Charlotte and I will be your host tonight. We've got five fantastic speakers lined up for you this evening as we discuss why do eggs fail? But before we get on to that, I'd just like to share with you how you can take part in tonight's event, because we really welcome your questions as we go along. So in order to share your questions with this evening's speakers, please uh, go to the website www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931. That's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931 and there you'll be able to submit your question for our speakers. If it's for a particular speaker then please do let us know who so we can direct it to the appropriate person and while you're on there do have a look at the other questions that people have been asking because you also have the opportunity to upvote other questions so if there's one you really like the look of then uh, please give it your your tick so that we can see what the most popular questions are and make sure that we prioritize those. If you're not able to access that website for any reason, then you can send us uh, an email, which is to scientific.events at zsl.org. That's scientific.events at zsl.org, and we will throw those into the mix for you. At the end of the event this evening, I'm going to be sharing a link with you so that you can give us your feedback, let us know what you thought of tonight's event, and that is www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event seven, but I will share that with you again later. So as I mentioned tonight, we've got five great um, speakers taking part in, in the event. Um, and the first one we're going to be meeting is Dr. Patricia Breck, who works at the Institute of Zoology here at ZSL. Patricia is a conservation biologist and research fellow at the Institute of Zoology. Her research focuses on assessing the impact of conservation interventions on the genetic health of threatened, threatened bird populations. Patricia's interest in female reproductive failure stems from her work on captive breeding and reintroduction programs and the associated impact of inbreeding on hatching success and offspring survival. Patricia is going to be kicking off this evening by explaining a little bit more about hatching failure in conservation. Patricia, over to you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, that was a really nice introduction and thank you for having me today. Um, I will start sharing my screen. So hopefully that's working. So yes, thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, the focus of my talk today will be on female reproductive failure in birds in the context of conservation. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Ashley Marshall, Faye Morland, Catherine Atherson, and Nicola Hemmings. They have done a lot of the work I'll be presenting today. And give thanks to the many entities that have supported us in developing the work, not only here, but also in New Zealand. In the last 500 years, we have lost 182 bird species. And many of these species, like the passenger pigeon, attempts were made to breed them in captivity once they declined. But these um, failed because they had high levels of hatching failure and nestling mortality. We have learned a lot since then. A recent study by Bolla Metal found that in the last few decades, with conservation interventions, 32 bird species have been prevented from going extinct. Many of these by the dedication of conservation managers such as Don Merton, here with Old Blue, the last remaining black robin left in the world by 1980. To save the species from imminent extinction, he pulled Old Blue's eggs and made her lay some more and cross-fostered those eggs to be incubated by other species like the Chatham Island warbler and the tomtits. Today, there are nearly 300 Chatham Island black robins left in the world, slowly moving away from the extinction abyss. In the black robin, around 35% of eggs fail to hatch, but in species like the kakapo, pink pigeon, Californian condor, over 60% of eggs fail to hatch, making recovery much more precarious and reliant on the dedication of managers like Don Merton to keep these species alive and breeding. 
The work to save species from extinction by learning how to breed them successfully continues. Zoos currently hold five species of birds that are extinct in the wild. A head curator of birds, Gary Ward, will join us later during a Q&A to discuss some of the work that he and his team are doing, including the reintroduction of the critically endangered and extinct in the wild Vietnam pheasant and the wattle crane captive breeding program. The techniques that we use to breed birds that are threatened vary from simply adding nest boxes to their breeding sites, such as what we do for the New Zealand hihi, which is the species that I work with, to much more technically challenging, such as artificial insemination in the kākāpō and artificial incubation in the kāki, which is also known as black stilt. These techniques are generally introduced to reduce the chances of egg failing. A meta-analysis currently being undertaken by Ashley Marshall, one of our PhD students, explains why we need to develop egg-specific management interventions as species become rarer. Threatened species experience up to seven times more hatching failure than non-threatened species. The higher the extinction risk, the more likely the species is to experience hatching failure. This trend is consistent in wild and captive populations, but captive populations tend to have high, high, higher hatching failure than wild populations. Likely because despite our best efforts, we cannot really replicate the conditions that they experience in the wild. And also captive populations are much smaller and contain some of the most threatened species. This trend highlights the importance of understanding the drivers of hatching failure in both settings, in captivity, but also in the wild. When Ashley looked a bit deeper at the literature, uh, to look at the eggs that reported failure, she found that a large pro proportion of the studies, nearly 40%, uh, do not report the, re the reasons why failure occurs. And in the remaining studies where they do, the reasons for failure are commonly assumed rather than actually tested. This makes it particularly difficult to truly test the relative importance of each of these, driver, of these drivers of hatching failure within a broader context across species. Embryonic depression is one of the most commonly reported drivers, as I said before, of hatching failure in threatened species. In the endangered New Zealand hihi, we have hatching failure of around 35%. We tested the impact of inbreeding on hatching success and found that it depressed embryo survival and that male embryos were particularly susceptible. But we missed one key factor about embryo mortality in the study. We assumed that undeveloped eggs that did not have an embryo that was visible to the naked eye were infertile. When in fact, the vast majority of undeveloped eggs in hihi have been fertilized, but the embryo has died at very early stages of development. Nicola Hemmings will be explaining in more detail how we assess eggs during her talk. Now this tends to be more obvious when you look at fresh eggs uh, laid by chickens, for example. But we have to remember that we take eggs from wild and threatened species uh, very, we can't take eggs from wild and threatened species very early. They're usually removed once the eggs, once the chicks fledge. And because of this, they tend to decompose, making assessing fertility much harder. Once we understand why eggs are failing, we can start to develop research to investigate how these patterns of infertility and embryo mortality might be arising. With our long-term HEHE -he data set, uh, another one of our PhD students, Faye Moreland, is now testing how genetics and the environment interact to drive hatching failure over time. Only a handful of studies have checked and developed eggs for infertility and early embryo mortality. And in all of these, infertility levels have been overestimated with potential repercussions for management. So how can we address this gap in our understanding of hatching failure in wild and threatened species? First, a very basic one, but really important in my opinion. We all need to define hatching failure consistently and accurately. We define hatching failure as a proportion of eggs surviving to the end of incubation that fail to hatch. This excludes eggs that have been lost to predation, abandonment, damage, or loss, for example. The reason we think this would help is because when Ashley extracted the hatching failure data for over a thousand ornithological articles, she found around 318 definitions of hatching success, 
20 definitions of hatching failure, 45 definitions of hatchability, and 44 other terms that encompass the same idea. A mind-boggling number of interpretations and ways of measuring hatching failure, making it really hard to understand what hatching failure actually is and the broad scale patterns that occur, and also how successful different types of intervention are. The second gap that I think we need to, to cover is, we need to accurately estimate the levels of infertility and early embryo death, like what we did in our study. In a study by Hemmings 2012, she found that on average, 74% of eggs classified as infertile by ornithologists showed some level of fertilization and development. So overestima overestimating infertility can have very dramatic consequences for breeding programs of threatened species, such as the removal of individu individuals from breeding programs based on uncertain fertility statuses. So say, assessing true fertility levels, uh, true levels of infertility, sorry, is vital, particularly in populations where undeveloped eggs cannot be assessed using visual inspection. For example, in these species in this graph, we show the uh, levels of infertility in these, uh, in these articles, and then we estimated the true levels of infertility using Nicholas uh, averages. And as you can see, the true levels of infertility seem to be much lower. And also, oh, before I go on to something else, so in our, we also have, um, sorry to plug this, but we have a recent publication, Animal Conservation, that has a link to a step-by-step -step guide on how to assess eggs that is open and free for everyone to use in case you're interested in assessing eggs yourself. So third, uh, another issue we need to assess is publication and research bias. Uh, PhD student Catherine Assassin assessed avian fertility literature between 1985 and 2020, so the last 35 years, in both domestic and wild species. And she found that nearly twice as many papers exist on male avian fertility compared to female avian fertility. And this discrepancy seems to be getting worse over time. Understanding female fertility is really essential to understanding reproductive success. And if we don't understand reproductive success and hatching failure, it's really hard to develop tools to tackle it. The fourth area that I think needs some, some focus is another, another piece of work that Catherine's doing, which is that she found that unsurprisingly, probably 79% of all articles published in the avian fertility literature over the last 100 years is on domestic species. And the vast majority of these are actually in chickens and other galliforms. We have learned an incredible amount from poultry science. Many of the techniques that we apply today to threatened species have been developed in industry. However, there's a huge variation in physiology and life history traits among birds and threatened species also tend to have, they also tend to be quite evolutionary distinct and have complex life histories. Therefore, more research is needed in wild and non-model systems so that we can develop techniques for a wider set of species. And my fifth and final gap is one that I think is really, really important, which is communicating widely and openly with conservation, the conservation practitioner community to understand the issues that they face day to day when breeding rare species which enable us to develop a research agenda that's not only high quality science, for example, but is also high impact in practice. Collaborating closely in a mutually beneficial way, we hope to produce research and tools that will be useful and applied so that we can improve breeding outcomes for a larger, wider range of species. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patricia, for that, that introduction and, and overview. Really interesting. Um, as you mentioned, we're also joined by Gary Ward, uh, who is the Curator of Birds at the Zoological Society of London. So thanks very much for, for joining us as well, um, Gary. Um, there are quite a few questions already on the pigeonhole, which is fantastic. So we're going to take a few of those now. Um, and basically after each speaker this evening, we'll take your questions. And then we will also have time at the end of the event for a few more when we'll, we'll bring everyone back. Um, so just to remind everyone who's watching this evening, 
how you can submit your questions. Um, you've got two options. You can go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1931 and post your questions there. Don't forget to upvote other people's questions as well. Or you can send us an email to scientific.events at zsl.org. Um, so before we get on to uh, those questions, mm. Gary, thanks um, again for joining us as well this evening. Um, you've been working quite closely with, uh, with Patricia. Um, can, can you just give us a quick summary as to sort of your, your involvement in, in this work? Yes, um, thank you. And one of the things that we have been doing as a collection is providing eggs um, from our collection, eggs that fail to hatch, or eggs that we've removed for management reasons, um, and then provided them to students such as Ashley, who so they can develop these techniques for assessing fertility in eggs, which appear to us to be infertile, but they're able to find some um, early, early embryonic death for other reasons why they may be fertile. So that's our biggest role that we've been uh, playing in terms of providing um, assistance to this, to the projects and the research that, that Patricia was outlining there. Great, thank you very much. Well, do keep sending your questions in for Patricia and uh, Gary. Patricia, I have one for you. Um, first of all, that you may not have the immediate reference or link to, but um, do you have a reference for the low hatchability in California condor uh, that you mentioned in your talk? I think you said it was stated as a 60% failure. I don't have it off the top of my head. I can find it and share it. That's, that's fine. Um, if you posted that question for Patricia, then if you could send it to our email address, scientific.events at zsl.org, then we will be able to reply to you and, and send you that link. Thank you very that's much. No <laughs> um, right, let's have a look. There's also a question which came in um, right at the beginning, which I, I, you did sort of allude to, Patricia, but um, I just wondered if maybe you could... Um, sort of respond to which mm -hmm. is do certain species of bird have lower hatch rates than others and if so why yes so uh threatened species usually have uh lower levels of hatching um the drivers of hatching failure so why we think eggs are, are failing in this species the usual um drivers are incubation issues um Inbreeding depression is another common one. Um, environmental contaminants. Um, there's quite a there's quite a number of different reasons why eggs fail. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that in captivity and in the wild, those drivers are different, and so we need to understand each one of those drivers or those drivers independently in both uh, types of populations, so that we can target management better. Great, thank you. Um, and then another one for you, is the failure of an embryo due to sperm or egg specific or an interaction of the two gametes under certain conditions that are external? So if there's failure of sperm or egg, then they, there would be no syngamy, so there wouldn't be fertilization. Um, so, em so embryo mortality generally occurs, well, there could be DNA incompatibilities, for example, uh, that could cause the embryo to fail early. It could be environmental conditions that could, you know, for example, cold snaps or warm snaps that, that can cause embryo mortality. There's also, um, for example, disease can also lead to embryo mortality. So there's quite a few things that lead to embryo mortality. But if there's issues with the egg itself, with the ovum or the sperm, then generally fertilization doesn't actually occur. Thank you. Um, and one more before we, we move on. Does sexual selection explain egg hatching success at all? Uh, or is there a meaningful way to carry out such an analysis on the role of sexual selection on hatching success? Um, so it, I guess it depends on what you mean by sexual selection. So um, I guess it could, the number of, so for example, in birds, you need multiple sperm to reach the egg. So potentially if you have less copulations or copulations with a smaller number of males, sometimes depending on the species life history, then that could influence the amount of sperm that you have available to fertilize your eggs. So maybe that could influence 
fertility rates across populations, but probably uh, maybe Nicola knows a little bit more about how sexual selection might impact fertility or fertilization failure. Well, maybe that's one we can come back to later on yeah. when, when we have uh, the others with us. But thank you so much, Patricia and Gary. Do keep sending in your, your questions for, for both Patricia and Gary, and we'll be able to ask them some, some more later on. But we're now going to move on to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Barbara Chiran. Um, Barbara is a senior lecturer in evolutionary ecology at the University of Exeter. Her research combines approaches and techniques from evolutionary biology, physiology, and genomics to understand the causes and consequences of variation in reproductive behavior. She has a particular interest in eggs, how the prenatal environment shapes an individual's life, and the costs associated with egg production for the mother. Barbara, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Over to you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I will share my screen. Okay. As uh, Charlotte mentioned, my name is Barbara Tieren. I'm an evolutionary biologist at the University of Exeter, working on the evolution and evolutionary consequences of variation in reproductive behavior in birds. And in the study I would like to present uh, this evening, we were interested to, to understand why and how variation in egg size is maintained in bird populations. Or in other words, why do birds not lay large eggs? Hatching is an extremely exhausting process. Here you can see uh, photos of the last batch of chicken eggs that we incubated. And in chicken, it takes typically between five to seven hours from the first pip here in the first photo until the chick bre fully breaks out of the egg here in the last photo. So a typically five to seven hour hatching duration. Sometimes this process can also take much longer up to 24 hours. And this process, this hatching process is extremely energetically demanding and exhausting for the chick. And in our case here, all chicks are hatched successfully, but this is not always the case. And indeed, mortality during this last stage of embryo development and hatching can be quite high across bird species. And unlike uh, early stage embryo mortality, which is strongly influenced by genetic factors, Mortality at these last stages of embryo development and hatching is mostly affected by environmental factors such as temperature and egg quality. In particular, we find that egg size matters. Egg size, which reflects the amount of nutrients and energy the embryo has available to during prenatal development. And egg size is um, linked, is a, is a predictor of mortality during uh, the hatching process with chicks that developed in a relatively small egg uh, having a higher mortality risk during hatching. And this effect is found across bird species. Furthermore, we find that chicks that developed in a relatively large egg have a higher probability of post-hatching survival. And this effect is mostly found or particularly strong um, during the first few days after hatching. So given these benefits for offspring survival, why do females not lay larger eggs? We uh, addressed this question in a captive population of Japanese quail. And uh, in quail, like in all bird species, we find very large variation in egg size within a population, with the largest eggs uh, being up to 70% larger than the smallest eggs laid in the same population. This egg size variation is found at the among female level, so different females lay differently sized eggs, whereas there is very little variation in egg size within a female or a clutch. And uh, finally, this among female variation in egg size has a heritable basis. In our study, we exploited this heritable among female variation in egg size to create artificial selection lines for divergent maternal egg investment. 
So we selectively bred females that laid relatively large or relatively small eggs for their body size um, for several generations. And as you can see, uh, there was a strong and rapid response to our selection regime that um, only after a few generations of selective breeding, females from the high maternal investment lines laying uh, significantly larger eggs compared to females from the low maternal investment lines. And importantly, we did not find uh, a change in the number of eggs these females laid. So females that laid larger eggs uh, invested overall more in, in reproduction. We then used these genetic lines for high or low maternal egg investment to estimate the costs associated with laying larger eggs for the female. So in the first step, we quantified the metabolic costs of laying larger eggs. And for this, we measured the resting metabolic rate of females uh, from the divergent lines before breeding, so during the non-reproductive period, and uh, during reproduction. And as you can see, there was this massive increase in uh, the metabolic rate of females when they started uh, reproduction, so an increase of uh, about 70% illustrating uh, this enormous cost associated with reproduction for the female. Importantly, there still was no difference in the metabolic rate uh, during the non-reproductive period uh, between females from the divergent lines. Females that laid larger eggs increased their uh, metabolic rate significantly more uh, compared to females laying uh, smaller eggs. And this difference in the increase uh, in metabolic rate uh, between uh, the divergent lines was about 15%. Um, so this, this really illustrates that laying large eggs is associated with increased energy costs for the female. In a second step, we then investigated how differential investment in eggs affects gene expression in, in the females. And for this, we used the whole transcriptome sequencing approach called RNA-seq, which allows us to quantify the expression of all genes in the genome simultaneously. And when using this approach, we found that there was a set of genes that was systematically and consistently upregulated in females laying larger eggs. And most of these genes um, were um, associated with reproduction, including genes involved in the regulation of the estrus cycle, of follicle development and ovulation, or the production of yolk. And this is, of course, not surprising, given that females from the divergent lines differ in the reproductive investment they are making. What was more intriguing was the set of genes that were systematically down-regulated in females laying larger eggs, because many of those uh, systematically down-regulated genes were involved in immune function, including genes that encode innate immune receptors, genes that are involved in inflammatory responses or innate immune function. It also included uh, a particularly interesting gene called MX, which is directly, has been directly linked to avian influenza resistance in chicken. And indeed, we found that uh, genes uh, linked to the response to viruses were sevenfold overrepresented among these systematically downregulated genes in females laying larger eggs. To understand the consequence of this downregulation of the immune system for pathogen susceptibility, we then measured the strength of uh, the immune response after vaccination in females laying large or small eggs. And vaccine, uh, vaccines expose an individual to parts of an inactivated pathogen, allowing the immune system to mount an immune response against this pathogen. And we can measure the strength of this immune response as the amount of specific antibodies produced by the individual with a stronger response reflecting a better protection against infection. And when measuring this specific uh, antibody response after such a vaccination, 
we found a very strong difference between females laying large or small eggs, uh, females laying larger eggs having a significantly weaker antibody response. This find, finding is in line with the results from the gene expression study and suggests that lower immune functioning and thus an increased susceptibility to see the disease is a cost of producing larger eggs. So to summarize, we found evidence for increased metabolic as well as immunological costs associated with producing larger eggs. And this uh, cost had consequences um, for female lifespan, with females laying larger eggs, uh, living on average 8% uh, shorter lives in our population compared to females laying relatively small eggs. So our study revealed a, a classical life history trade-off with females laying larger eggs, um, or with the investment in reproduction in, in, in egg size being directly negatively linked to investment in self-maintenance. And this trade-off, this life history trade-off will constrain the evolution of egg size and can explain why and how variation in egg size is maintained in bird population. But it also has uh, applied implications, for example, for captive breeding programs as it suggests that selection for larger eggs and therefore increased hatching success might inadvertently increase disease susceptibility in the population. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, um, Barbara. Really interesting insight there, and especially sort of the, the implications then for um, captive breeding and captive populations of, of birds and the choices we make. Um, we've had lots of questions through, which is fantastic. So I'm going to see how many I can, I can get through in the next few minutes for you. Um, the first question is, do you find any sex, any sex ratio differences among your trade-offs between size and immune function? So interestingly, we find uh, this reduction in immune function also in males from the divergent lines. And this is very interesting because obviously males don't lay eggs. Um, so indicating that this reduction in immune function is not linked to the, to the energetic expenditure of producing these larger eggs, but that it's really um, some fundamental difference in how genes are regulated and expressed. So we believe that, um, uh, that it's really the gene expression network that is affected by, by this uh, selection uh, that we imposed on this, on this spirit. So the fact that also males are affected suggests that it's not a, a, a direct energy a trade-off, but it's rather um, a gene expression uh, and gene regulation trade-off that we see here. Interesting, thank you. Um, is there a comparison on egg sizes between wild and captively bred species? Um, so if there is a systematic difference between wild and captive birds or? Um, they'd, uh, they've just asked if there's a if yeah, if there's been any comparison on on egg sizes between between wild and captively bred species, um, and then go on to ask, is there any relationship in these these differences, associations in egg size and hatching success, which is slightly yeah, slightly I mean, it's interesting. So there are some uh, meta analyses that really went through the whole um, avian literature to basically test for. Uh, associations between egg size and hatching success. And this is really a very general pattern that is seen in captive and wild birds, this association uh, between egg size and, uh, and hatching success or mortality during the hatching process. So this seems to be a very general pattern. And um, we also then see uh, also across bird species that they also uh, longer term effects. I mentioned this uh, post hatching survival. We even find uh, effects on the reproduction success of, of a bird. Um, so the, the size of the egg uh, an individual developed in will affect also this uh, long-term reproductive success and cycle 
of this individual. So there are short term consequences, but also some very long term consequences. And as far as we know, these are very, very general patterns that occur across bird species. Uh, another question, um, still focusing on, on eggs. Um, can the egg size be influenced by dominant status in social birds, to your knowledge? Um, that is a very interesting one. So there is actually uh, evidence that, for example, in cooperative breeders, then that when there are a lot of helpers around, that the dominant female will reduce egg size. And the idea is that because there is so much help at the post-hatching, during the post-hatching period, that she doesn't need the alpha female, the dominant female doesn't need to invest so heavily in eggs. Basically, uh, the helpers can compensate for relatively small eggs by providing more food uh, post-hatching. So there are these effects, especially in cooperative breeders, um, where helper numbers, uh, group size will influence uh, egg size of the dominant female. Yeah. Okay. And one final, final question for now for you, Barbara. Are larger eggs more fragile in their structure in your quails under artificial selection? So this is a, a very interesting uh, question because we actually found that the um, patterning, the, so quail eggs uh, have a very uh, interesting maculation, eggshell maculation, and we actually found that these maculation patterns changed in response to our selection regime. So um, eggs from the larger eggs, they had more of these dark spots. And there is one hypothesis that these dark spots actually um, act as some kind of a reinforcement of the shell. So they make the shell stronger. So it's only a hypothesis at the moment, but one idea is that uh, because larger eggs might be more fragile, that actually this goes then hand in hand with the change in this maculation to make them stronger again. But um, we have not looked into that uh, in more detail. It's, a, it's, I think, an interesting hypothesis to explore further. Definitely one for, for further study. Thank you ever so much, Barbara. We will bring you back uh, later on. So do keep sending your questions in for Barbara. But now we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Nicola Hemmings. Nicola is a Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellow at the University of Sheffield. Her research group studies how and why animals vary in their ability to reproduce, with particular focus on the causes of infertility and embryo death in in birds. She has developed and applied methods for examining failed eggs and diagnosing fertility issues for a range of different bird species, using them to investigate both the evolutionary consequences of hatching failure and potential mitigation strategies for conservation programs. Nicola, thank you very much this evening uh, for joining us. Hi, I'll just share my screen. Just give me a second. Hey, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Charlotte, um, and also thanks to Patricia, who uh, gave a great introduction to the group, to the work that my group has been doing in collaboration with her group as well. And we are obviously talking a lot about eggs today, and I guess most of us here will be familiar with the basic components of an egg. So take this chicken egg, for example, um, or if you'd like something very similar, but perhaps a little bit more exciting, this penguin egg. This is a, an undeveloped egg from the captive population of Humboldt penguins at London Zoo. Uh, so one of the um, collections that uh, Gary was talking about earlier. Um, and this is from one of the most recent batches of eggs that I've been examining here in Sheffield. So most of us have, um, have cracked a hard shelled egg. Uh, on our kitchen worktop and emptied the contents into a dish, although admittedly probably not a penguin egg. Um, so you should be probably familiar with the yolk and the albumin, but have you ever wondered what it really takes for an egg to develop into a new chick? 
Well, the large yolky eggs of birds provide almost everything that a developing embryo needs in order to uh, survive and hatch. And they are crafted inside the mother's body. And because of that, they represent a significant energy investment by her, as we've just heard from Barbara. Hatching failure therefore comes at a high cost, particularly to females, um, and yet in many threatened bird species, um, a large proportion of eggs never, uh, never hatch. So if we're going to understand um, why this happens, then we need to first have a really detailed understanding of the biology of fertilization and early embryo development. And that's what I am hoping to give you a kind of whirlwind tour of this evening. So let's start with the events that occur just before fertilization. In birds, sperm arrive at the site of fertilization, ready for ovulation, um, and they, uh, and this is right at the top of the reproductive system. So this is a schematic drawing of the reproductive system in a female bird. And the sperm arrive in a place called the infundibulum. And they do so in their hundreds or even in some species in their thousands. And when an egg or an ovum is released from the bird's ovary, it's literally just a yolk like this, um, surrounded by a single layer. And this is called the inner perivitaline layer, and it holds all of that yolk together. And when an egg um, or uh, when once the egg is ovulated uh, for fertilization to take place, sperm must reach and penetrate this layer um, within about 15 minutes of ovulation. And when sperm enter the ovum, they leave tiny holes, microscopic marks of their entrance. Now, not just one, but several sperm penetrate the uh, avian ovum. And our research has shown that unlike in mammals, multiple sperm are needed to ensure that the egg uh, develops. And this is really different to mammals like us, um, because uh, in mammals, penetration of the egg by more than one sperm will destroy the egg in most cases. Now, although only one sperm typically fertilizes uh, the bird's egg and actually contributes genetic material to the resulting embryo, uh, other sperm appear to play a role in triggering those early stages of embryonic development. Without these extra sperm uh, inside the ovum, the embryo will be very unlikely to develop. After that 15 minute um, fertilization window that I mentioned before, any additional sperm that was swarming around the egg at the time of uh, fertilization, trying to get in, are stuck to the surface of the ovum by glycoproteins, which are excreted from the female's reproductive system. And they form a second impenetrable layer around the ovum called the outer perivitaline layer. Now, next time you do crack an egg, perhaps to make your breakfast, take a closer look at the yolk. You'll notice that it's bound by, a tra by this transparent layer. It's like a bag that essentially holds all of that yolk. And if you um, puncture the yolk with a fork, the, yo the yolk will then ooze out of the hole that you've made in that layer. And this layer is the combined inner and outer perivitaline layer. Now, if you went a step further and you used a pair of scissors to cut through your egg yolk, just like this, and then you've got a pair of forceps or a pair of tweezers and grabbed the edge of the perivitaline layer and just tried to lift it up away from the yolk. And then you washed the perivitaline layer in a bit of water, um, you would actually be able to see it quite clearly. And this is something you can actually do at home if you want to with, with a chicken egg from the supermarket. It looks just like a slimy bit of membrane, really. But amazingly, this layer can provide us with a complete picture of what happened just after this egg was ovulated inside the female bird's body. And I'll explain how in a minute. So once fertilized, the ovum then continues on its journey 
through the female bird's uh, reproductive system, the albumin gets added, the other components like the um, shell membrane and the shell uh, added all along the way. And then finally, just under 24 hours later, it's laid by which time the developing embryo, which appears just as a tiny white disc that you can just about see in the middle here on the surface of the yolk, it's already a rapidly dividing disc of tens of thousands of cells. But what if sperm don't make it to the ovum before the outer paravitaline layer is formed? What if the female fails to copulate or the male that she copulates with doesn't produce sufficient sperm? Well, as the chicken eggs that line our supermarket shelves demonstrate, egg formation proceeds regardless um, and an unfertilized but otherwise perfectly formed egg will emerge from the female within the same time frame with a germinal disc that contains nothing but a single lonely female pronucleus. The amazing and unique thing about birds eggs is that in any given laid egg we can find the traces of all of these events. So as I said, uh, the, the paravitaline layer literally gives us a snapshot of what happened at the time of fertilization. If the egg was fertilized, then sperm will be trapped in the paravitaline layer. The holes will remain in place. And um, if we look to the germinal disc, we will be able to find embryonic nuclei if the embryo started to develop. And so all of these things we can do using microscopic techniques, using fluorescence microscopy, we use special dyes that bind to the DNA inside the sperm heads, inside the nuclei of the embry embryonic cells, and they light up under uh, fluorescence illumination. And this allows us to see this stuff in, in great detail. The contents of failed eggs, therefore, can tell us in precise detail the story of their fertilization and early embryonic development, or lack of it. And as such, they give us unrivaled insight into what went wrong, the underlying mechanistic basis of hatching failure. Now let me briefly provide an example of the utility of this information for conservation. This is the kakapo. You might be familiar with this bird. Um, it's a ground dwelling parrot, native to New Zealand, arguably one of the most unique and iconic uh, birds. But the kakapo has one of the highest levels of hatching failure of all bird species. About two thirds of all eggs they lay never hatch. And there are only just over 200 of these birds left on Earth. Most failed kakapo eggs show no sign of development and have been assumed to be infertile, unfertilized. However, until recently, it wasn't known for sure if they were truly unfertilized. So in effect, if no sperm had managed to make it into the egg or if they had been fertilized, but then just died at a very early stage of development before any obvious embryo uh, could be seen. Now, if they were unfertilized and no sperm had reached the egg, then this would obviously suggest a major issue with male fertility and sperm production in this species. So it's quite an important thing to figure out. In 2019, Kakapo had a bumper breeding season, a record breaking 252 eggs were laid. But unfortunately, as you might expect, given their high rates of hatching failure, 128 of these eggs showed no sign of development. We collaborated with the Kakapo recovery team in uh, 2019 uh, to assess whether these undeveloped eggs were truly unfertilized. And this was the first time that this had been done for this species. And we found, in fact, that 90 eggs were fertilized and only 34 of those we examined were unfertilized. And um, we only couldn't uh, examine four eggs due to de degradation. So we, we had a pretty good sample of all of the failed eggs that season. The true rate of fertilization failure across all eggs laid was therefore just 13%, much lower than the 52% that had previously been assumed. And this obviously indicates that male fertility alone 
is probably less of an issue for this species than previously thought, which is actually great news uh, for Kakapo. Now, as you can see from this figure, um, it shows the fates of all Kakapo eggs from 2019. The primary driver of hatching failure and overall reproductive failure uh, was early embryo mortality occurring within the first five days of development. If we include embryo mortalities occurring up to day 10 of um, development, so basically kind of the first third of incubation, that accounts for nearly half of all Kakapo eggs laid. We now hope to continue to work with the recovery team, as well as some uh, amazing conservation geneticists in New Zealand to try to identify the genetic and environmental drivers of this dramatic rate of prenatal mortality. Now, this is just one case study of many, and Patricia has already shown you several other examples where we're applying um, this work to various threatened species. We've been using these approaches on a wide range of different species, collaborating with various organisations, including uh, ZSL. Um, and that's why I had these the Humboldt penguin eggs uh, here today as well. And the broader aim is, for us is to try to understand the factors that lead to elevated rates of hatching failure in threatened birds and what can be done to address them. But we do want to go further than this. Um, we hope that other ornithologists and uh, conservation managers will widely adopt these uh, approaches to understanding hatching uh, failure in, focal in their focal populations as well. And that's why we've developed the openly accessible resources that Patricia mentioned earlier, so that hopefully you can use these techniques as well yourself. As Patricia said, every egg is crucial to success in bird conservation programmes and understanding how those eggs function is therefore vital to securing the future of many bird species. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicola. That was absolutely fascinating really interesting to see those those videos and to hear more about your work as well and those um free resources that you mentioned the open access resources that um patricia also referred to at the beginning of this evening's event you can find the link to all of those in the blog which is associated with tonight's event on our website so do look there if you'd like to find out more information um nicola i've got lots of questions for you that have come through so I will ask you the first one, which is, are legs laid under naturally hotter days qualita qualitatively different to those laid under normal temperatures? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know of any research that's actually been done directly on that question. So I guess what you're asking there is, um, you know, within a population, we, would we expect eggs that have been laid on hotter days uh, to be different in some way? Um, and I don't know of any studies actually that have tested that ex explicitly, but you could imagine that under very high temperatures, which might be quite stressful um, for uh, birds, that you may see a negative effect of very high temperatures on egg production because of heat stress. Um, and I think there might be some uh, evidence for that in uh, domestic poultry, actually, when birds are, are kept in, I guess, quite dense conditions and heat can become a problem mm -hmm. um, but it would be really interesting to know whether that was the case in the context of um, you know climate change because obviously birds are now having to cope with varying temperatures varying weather conditions all the time we're seeing this much more and it'd be really interesting it's a really interesting point actually to know whether that has a direct impact on the on the quality of the egg they produce. Mm. Great. Um, another question for you. How common is polyspermy among failed eggs? What are the key mechanisms to keep this under check? OK, so in in birds, polyspermy is actually a kind of a requirement for for normal uh, development. So we in most eggs that have been fertilized is very normal to see multiple sperm entering and um, in general in birds it doesn't seem like 
in contrast to mammals, it doesn't seem that polyspermy would be associated with a higher level of uh, egg failure uh, due to embryo death. In fact, you'd expect quite the opposite. We did some uh, experimental work where we um, used artificial inseminations to reduce the number of sperm uh, right down to as, as small level as possible so that very, very few sperm could reach the ovum. And we managed to do this to, to such a degree um, using chickens that um, we could really limit limit the sperm and just have one or two sperm managing to penetrate the, the egg. And in, in those cases, embryo mortality was actually far more likely to occur. And, and we think it's because basically these extra sperm contribute something else to the egg that helps to trigger the initial cell cycles of, of embryo development. There's some evidence that that is the case in frogs as well. So some research that's been uh, done in frogs has shown that um, multiple sperm need to penetrate the egg in different places in order to trigger, trigger waves of calcium ions across the egg surface, which are really important in those initial embryonic cell cycles. So perhaps it's something like that. We still don't actually know exactly what the mechanism is there in birds, but certainly um, having more sperm is better than having too few. Mm, interesting. Um, and your case study at the end of the, the Kalkapo has obviously brought up um, quite a few questions relating to, to then them. So I'm going to test your knowledge now on, on this subject um, with the question, are the um, Kalkapo egg, is the Kalkapo egg hatching failure due to higher pathogen load or is it some way an adaptive strategy where they lay more than required? Um, so we know very little about the actual mechanisms driving hatching failure in Kagapur. We're mm -hmm. just at the very start of trying to understand this. And, and this study that I talked about today was really the starting point. The first thing we needed to figure out is, is this really a fertility issue as it was thought to be? Or is there something else going on? OK, so now we know there's something else going on. I think it's very unlikely to be an adaptive strategy, if I'm totally honest. Um, Kakapur don't lay a, a lot of eggs in general, um, so it's it's not typical for them to kind of lay many, many, many eggs, and, and some of those ha uh, some of those fail. Um, so I think that it's certainly something that's going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, Kakapur are likely to be highly inbred, so it could be uh, an effect of inbreeding depression. It could be uh, linked to that, a kind of genetic compatibility issue between the, uh, the mother and the father, if they are genetically quite similar. Um, and the reason that I think that that could be the case uh, as well is because we see such high levels of embryo mortality very early on in development. That really suggests that it is a genetic issue. So something that's disrupting like the early stages of gene expression when the embryo is, is kind of in those early stages of development. Um, so yeah, we still don't know, but th those are my kind of vague ideas for now. And hopefully we will find out more in the coming years. Thank you so much, Nicola. Well, um, I'll give you a little break now and we'll, we'll bring you back shortly for the Q&A at the end of this evening's event. But now we're going to hear from our final speaker tonight, who is Dr. Jen Smart. Jen works for the RSPB Centre for Conservation Science, where she heads up the science team working on a whole range of conservation issues across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Her own research spe specialism is breeding lowland waders and especially conservation solutions to reverse their population declines, which involves understanding the factors reducing their breeding success and solutions that might increase the survival of their nests and chicks. Jen, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, and um, uh, thanks to the organisers for inviting me to speak this evening. I, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I've been absolutely fascinated and I've learned so much about eggs that I didn't know. So uh, really, really enjoying this evening and I hope you enjoy my talk. Um, I'll just attempt to share my screen now. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk to you this evening about the importance of breeding success in the conservation of lowland waders. Um, this is me in my, um, just change, oh, sorry. That's it. 
this is me in my happy place out in the field studying the waders that I've spent the last 20 years studying. Um, but unfortunately, my job now means I don't get to do this very often. So I really, I really relish the, the moments when I can be out in the field. And I've spent most of my career studying waders. And for those of you not familiar with waders, uh, there's five species at the top of this slide here. Uh, from the left-hand side, going from left to right, we have red shank, curlew, uh, lapwing, oyster catcher, and snipe. And the thing about waders is that these are species that are in trouble. Uh, most of these species have declined by over 40% in the last 30 years. You can see the figures on the, on the um, photos here. And then the maps below also show that not only have they declined in abundance, but they are changing in terms of their range. And what we see in these maps are that the blue areas are where the species have declined and the red areas are where the species has increased. So we've got widespread population declines and range contractions in a whole range of these wader species. And we know that a lot of the historical declines that occurred, you know, maybe three or four decades ago were largely around, you know, reductions in the amount of breeding habitat that these species had, or also uh, declines in the quality of the remaining breeding habitat. But what we know now is that species that have declined in range and uh, abundance uh, are, are now subject to many other pressures. And one of those pressures which is really important for waders is, is predation, things eating their eggs and things eating their chicks. And we recently undertook a review of the scientific literature uh, for a whole range of bird species and we grouped them by these groups that you can see on the slide here. And from that, those scientific papers, we extracted information about the direction of the effect. So was, was the predation having a negative or a positive effect on the population and the strength of the evidence. And we created this evidence score. So something that's positive, uh, you know, plus three is a strong positive effect. Something that's minus three is a strong negative effect. And what we found from reviewing the scientific literature was that there was a strong evidence and compelling evidence for predation limiting populations of seabirds, game birds and waders at this current time. We also know from our long term studies, so this is data from just one study area where we've been studying uh, these four wader species for quite a long time. Uh, we also know quite a lot about the causes of egg failure. Uh, and what this graph here shows is the, um, the, the, the causes of egg failure in uh, about 800 nests. Uh, there's about 3,000 eggs involved in this graph here. And what we can see from this is that um, you know, just under 50% of eggs hatch. Uh, just under 40% of eggs fail due to predation, so things eating them. And then we've got much smaller percentages that fail for other reasons. Some are flooded, some get trampled by cattle, some are abandoned by the adults, that's whole clutches abandoned. And then we have this smallish percentage which, which are unhatched. And this is, this is what we've been talking about earlier tonight. So this is where I, I, a clutch hatches, but maybe one or sometimes two eggs in the clutch fail to hatch. Uh, and that's the unhatched percentage here. And we've been working with Nicola uh, with our unhatched eggs to try and understand the causes of, of this uh, failure to hatch. We also know from the studies we've been doing, we know quite a lot about who it is that's eating these eggs. So we use technology, we deploy miniature temperature loggers. You can see one of these in, in the fingers in the, in the picture here. And this just sits in the base of the nest and it's just recording temperature in that nest all the time. And what that can give us really good information about is the timing of uh, failure in these nests. So at what time did that predator visit that nest and eat the eggs within that nest? We see a big drop in temperature and it never recovers. And that tells us that about 80% of our nests are lost at night. And that also tells us that this must be largely down to mammal predators because only mammal predators in this country are active at night. But we can also use tiny miniature nest cameras on some of these nests to understand exactly the species that's eating these nests. And what we found is that about 70% were eaten by foxes, about 12% eaten by badgers, and then a much smaller percentage eaten by a whole range of other species. So when it comes to nests, we've got uh, predation, limiting breeding success in these species, and we've got mammal predators being really important at the egg stage part of the breeding cycle. And I guess what's important to understand here is that with waders, uh, we have to think about the egg stage failures, but we also have to think about the chick stage failures because waders, chicks leave the nests immediately upon hatching and feed themselves. And of course, they then suffer predation during that uh, uh, post-hatching and pre-fledging period. 
So what is what, what, how does this information help us in terms of the conservation of a threatened wader? We've heard a lot about the conservation of threatened species, and I'm going to focus the rest of this talk on the beautiful black-tailed godwit, which is what you can see in this picture here. This is probably the rarest wader in the UK. There were only 44 pairs of this, this species in the UK in 2017. The map on the right-hand side shows you where they occur within England. Um, there's a very small numbers breeding in the northwest of England and in the southwest of England, but the bulk of the population, 38 pairs in 2017, were all focused around the wetlands within the Fenland area of Cambridgeshire. And what that means is, you know, in a population that's so small, it means this population is very vulnerable because most of these uh, most of these birds are all nesting in one location, and and you know then they then they become very vulnerable to sort of stochastic events that can happen, flooding or mass mass predation or or other factors that influence their breeding success. We've done a lot of work on this species over the years, so we know quite a lot about their breeding success. And what this graph on the bottom shows is the breeding success that they've achieved between 1999 and 2006. This is breeding success in terms of the numbers of chicks fledged per pair of godwits in each of these years. You'll see this graph a few times throughout this presentation because I talk about the influence of our conservation interventions in a little while, so it's, it's good to understand what it means now. The dashed line is really important on this graph because that's what we think this species needs to achieve in order to maintain a stable population. So any year where the bar is above that line is a good year, and any year where the bar is below that line is a bad year. And what you can see if you look at the right-hand end of the graph is that there are many more bad years in the last 10 years than there were in the previous 10 years. So we've seen a big decline in breeding success in this species, and that's what's driving the current, uh, the population decline that we saw before we started our conservation work, our, our conservation work a few years ago. And we know from the sort of diagnostic research that we've been doing that this change in breeding success is, is related to a decline in uh, egg survival and an egg survival rated to increase in predation and a decline in the numbers of chicks getting to that fledging stage because of an increase in predation. And we know that a whole bunch of predators, the pictures here, uh, are important in that, in that whole story. So fortunately, we were successful in winning a big EU life grant, uh, which was a is a five year conservation project that we started with the primary aim of saving black tail godwits from extinction in the UK. We call it Project Godwits. And this is a partnership project between the RSPB and the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. Uh, and our major our major finance comes from from EU life. And that project has quite a few aims, and I'm just going to talk about the two aims that I'm, I've largely been involved with, which are around, uh, which are around, uh, you know, improving the fortunes of the species. Uh, and the first thing, of course, we've been trying to do is to improve the breeding success in the wild. We know breeding success in the wild is insufficient, so we needed to do something to improve breeding success. And because we know that breeding success is limited by predation of both eggs and chicks, and we know that lim it's limited by a whole range of predators eating those eggs and chicks, and because of the perilous nature of the population, we're actually throwing every tool we have in the conservation toolkit to try and reduce the impacts that these predators are having on this population. So we know red kites in some years can take lots of godwit chicks, and we know from other research that we've done that if you feed red kites, extra food during the breeding season, it can reduce their predatory, their, their need to go and prey on wild things. So we're feeding kites in the area. Because we know about the hugely important impact that foxes can have both on eggs and chicks, we're actually using lethal control measures to try and reduce the populations of foxes. But we're also using non-lethal measures like uh, predator fencing in, in different ways within the site, just to try and reduce how predators can move around within these locations and to try and keep them out of the really key locations for the species. So do we know that our uh, predator management interventions are having any success or not? Well, in 2015, uh, our trail camera monitoring, and this is the way we monitor these nocturnal mammals, uh, recorded 115 images of foxes, uh, but in 2019, we only captured one. So we seem to have uh, successfully reduced at least the activity of foxes within this, within this location. And we know that our, our fencing, our predator fencing around some of the really key godwit fields is, is really helping in terms of uh, reducing the, the number of nests that get predated in fields protected by fences. And that's what you can see on this graph here. The blue bars are nests within fields protected by predator-proof fences and gates. And the gray bar are nests within fields not protected by, by those things. So we can see a significant reduction in predation in relation to fencing. 
So are we managing to increase the productivity of the population? We are now uh, four years into this five-year conservation programme. This is the graph that I said you'd see repeatedly. So this is the population productivity, annual population productivity. I've now identified the four years where uh, Project Godwit has been active. Uh, and you can see that so far we haven't managed to uh, successfully increase productivity in the wild. And we think that's because although we've managed to you know, keep foxes out of some of the fields and we've managed to reduce the activity of foxes, um, we, do, we, we, don't, we cannot protect enough of the nests with fencing to improve nest survival sufficiently. And, we, and it's extremely difficult to protect the chicks from the impacts of predators at the chick stage because lots of those predators are avian predators and it's very difficult to exclude them or, or, to, or, to, or we can't reduce their populations. So we've not quite got there with breeding success in the wild. But the other thing we've been doing as part of this project is trialing a, a very novel, um, effectively a, a form of captive breeding, but it's called head starting. And what we do in the head starting program, and this is the bit of the project that's led by the, the Wildfire and Wetlands Trust because they have lots of expertise in sort of avi aviculture. We collect the very earliest clutches that these godwits lay in the wild. We collect those eggs and we collect whole clutches. We collect the earliest clutches and we collect them very early in the incubation period. And we take them into captivity and we uh, hatch those eggs in captivity and we rear the chicks in captivity and we release them at the point at which they fledge. So we've taken them out of the environment at the time when they're really vulnerable to the effects of predators. And the idea with head starting is that we can really provide the population with a boost in productivity. We can hopefully fledge many more chicks from head starting than we ever could in the wild. And then the, the other thing that's really potentially beneficial from head starting is that this species is incredibly site faithful. So adults will always go back to where they breed. Once they've chosen and where to breed, they, they tend to go back to the same site year after year after year, and chicks tend to recruit back to where they fledged from. So even when you've got a population that's increasing, it's quite difficult to get them to move to new locations. But by releasing them in new locations that have been specially created for them, we can hopefully facilitate colonization of new sites. So um, is the head starting increasing breeding success? Here's that graph again. Now what you can see is the red bit of the bar is the productivity, the contribution of head starting to the product Productivity of the population over the last four years. So you can see that we've created that massive boost in productivity. Just note, we weren't able to do head starting in 2020 because of the COVID pandemic, but we're back on it. We've got eggs in captivity as we speak and some starting to hatch now. Um, have we facilitated colonization? Well, these are the three sites that we hoped the species, uh, these head started chicks would recruit back to. And these are the numbers of head started chicks that have recruited to these sites. So we're seeing these head started chicks return after one or two years away and recruiting into the sites where we hoped they would recruit to. And what we're starting to see now is the population starting to turn around. At the Neen Washes, which is a site where it was really declining, we've seen the population stabilise. And at the Ooze Washes, where the, where the population was tiny, there were only three pairs at the start of this project, there are now more breeding pairs there than we've had for the last 20 years. So I just want to end by saying that like saving a species from extinction is not easy and it's a massive team effort. And this is just some of the characters that have been involved uh, in, in this process. And just a huge thanks to our, our partners, WWT, for, for all their efforts with the Head Starting and to our funders, uh, EU Life. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, really interesting to see the results there on on the head starting work in, in particular, and hopefully really, really positive um, news for the future. There's a question for you about your um, graphs um, and about the productivity from your graph appears to be variable. Um, can food supplementation drive productivity in the in this particular bird species to to your knowledge? I'm not sure what the question is alluding to in terms of food supplementation. Is this food supplementation in terms of what we feed the, the think, kites or? I think it might be for the, the godwits as, it is, as it's referring to, to the, the graphs. But yeah, yeah. I might be wrong. Yeah, OK, so so I, so there is no way we can provide extra food to these godwits. You know, these adults feed by using that really long bill you saw by probing the ground and, and feeding on soil invertebrates and aquatic invertebrates and wet pools. And when the chicks hatch, they, they literally get out of the egg, they dry and they're up and running. They've got really long legs and big feet and they can move like hell through the vegetation. But they're pecking it, it you know, it's it, it aerial invertebrates on the vegetation the whole time. So it would be incredibly difficult to try and provide these godwits with food supplementation, yeah. 
we don't see any evidence of food being li the limiting thing for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you preempted another question, which was about the impact of the pandemic. But um, but this viewer has also asked if there are policy changes likely uh, in the future to sort of counter counter some of the issues that that you're seeing. Yeah. So that, I mean, there's lots of different issues that affect this species. I mean, predation is the big one just now. It seems to be the biggest driver. But of course, you know, climate change might have impacts in future. These this species in wetland. Oh, we're losing your sound a bit, Jen. I'm not quite sure why. Or at least I've I've lost it. Breeds in wetland. The place one. Oh. Okay. Let's try try again. Is it back again now? It's back. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Could you? Okay. Hope yeah, it's back again that. now. Um. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so there are lots of things that affect the species. I mean, I mean, climate change might be one. So they nest in wetlands and they nest in wetlands that are prone to flooding because these acts as, as, as big flood storage areas for the whole of the middle of England, effectively. So the timing of the flood receding at the end of the winter is really important. And we did have one year in the project where the site was still flooded during at the beginning of the breeding season. And that forces these birds to go and nest on the arable land around the edges of the wetland, which is just a disaster for them. They never managed to rear any young there. So, you know, policy changes that might help with climate change or that might help about how we how we manage and look after these wetland sites, I think, uh, is, is going to be critically important. And then the other thing is that are migratory species as well. So they migrate down to West Africa for the winter. You know, so, so things in West Africa might affect them. Things on migration might affect them. And we know right now there's a huge um, uh, proposal to build a new airport in the Tagus estuary in Portugal. And the Tagus estuary is really important for this species. Uh, you know, individuals from the, across the range of the species congregate on the Tagus in spring. So if that airport gets built, that could be something really disastrous. So there are lots of uh, local and international policy things that could really affect this species. OK, and um, thank you very much, Jen. We're going to bring all of our speakers back now um, to see if we can answer some of the other questions that have been sent in this evening. Um, and I'm going to come to Patricia and um, Gary first, because there's one for, for the two of you, which is, are hatching failure rates monitored as a matter of course in captive contexts? And do these rates appear to change over time? Can this be linked to changes in husbandry? Um, Gary, I'm not sure if that's one you might be able yes. to answer. <clears throat> so definitely, I mean, everything in captivity is monitored. You know, we have very good advanced um, husbandry databases that we can um, input all that data into. And, um, and we can certainly see what the hatchability is. You know, every time it gets laid that we know of in our enclosures and our aviaries, that's, that's recorded. Um, and then what, what's often done in terms, if we've got a, a pair of birds that we think are producing infertile eggs, or those eggs never show any evidence to us as to infer to it, it being fertile. What's often done is they, those birds are repaired. So you'd provide a different male with the, to that female. Um, and this is why some of the research that has been outlined tonight is quite interesting because we are actually now starting to find out that it's not always that the male is infertile you know, that there's other factors going on. So, you know, um, other things that can happen is you increase uh, looking at the diet that we're providing the birds with that could be changed to provide better uh, success, um, peer compatibility. And, and that's something that when a lot of our conservation breeding programs, species are paired up because of the genetics, you know, and looking at their, their lineages. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that those two birds, this male and that female, look good on paper, but actually they're not going to necessarily like each other. So that's something that we always feed back to the stud books and say there's peer compatibility, compatibility issues there. Nest site provision is really important for us. So we range of different bird species that we work with, all nest in different ways. We've got cup nesters that build little nests, like a lot of passerines. We've got species like parrots that will nest in cavities. Um, so we have to provide those, nest, those nesting sites. And if we don't do that right, or there's some disturbance, or um, something's not, you know, not to the bird's liking, then that can also affect um, hatchability and, and egg breakages and stuff like that as well. So there's a whole host of things that we're doing all the time to try and improve hatchability in eggs um, and success breeding generally. 
Um, and so, yeah, and, uh, you know, I can go on and on about it. To be <laughs> And also once, you know, if, if an egg fails, it is then assessed by uh, the vets at the zoo. So they open it up and see what's happened and when the embryos died. And they normally track all that information uh, of egg failure as well. It's just when the egg is und- undeveloped that it comes to us for us to assess. And a lot of times uh, these captive eggs, they're removed a little bit earlier than in the wild. So it's easier to assess fertility visually, for example, than in some of the wild populations or wild threatened populations where there's a lot of degradation uh, and where assessing your fertility uh, visually is much, much harder. Mm-hmm. Super. Thank you both so much. Um, the most popular remaining questions aren't for anyone in particular. So I'm just going to ask someone to, to unmute um, and, uh, and try and answer some of these. So how does artificial incubation influence the success of hatchability? Might be one for me. Yeah. So, um, so the science of artificial incubation has come a long way in, you know, over the years. And um a lot of this is to do with the knowledge of the of the the keepers that are you know doing the incubation and how they manage those eggs during the incubation and how they manage the incubator. It's also got a lot to do with the incubator itself um, and these different you know different types of incubators, different makes, and some are very good and some not so good. Um, so yeah, so that's all. Those things are all played into all the time. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? I think I think so. Yes, thank you very much, Gary. Um, so the next question is: How does the female behaviour and health during incubation influence egg survival? Well, I I can answer that a little bit. Thank so um, yeah, female behaviour obviously impacts incubation. So how long she incubates for, uh, how often she leaves the nest how often she comes back to the nest so that obviously influences the embryo development and some females are better at incubation than others there's variation in that kind of behavior um there's some species for example where behavior has changed so for example in the black robin which i talked about um there was 50% of the population of black robins tended to lay their eggs on the rim of the nest rather than in the nest cup, which they think it's a a genetic trait from those very tiny number of individuals that were left in the population. And so then managers have to move the eggs from the rim into the center of the the nest so that they actually develop. Uh, And so that kind of aberration can happen when you have big population bottlenecks like the ones that those birds experienced. Um, So then obviously it's not necessarily uh, great in terms of whether that po- that behavior continues, which I don't think it actually has, but um, it's w- one of the things that can happen. And in terms of condition, obviously, some of um, uh, Barbara's work and some of Nicholas' work shows that diet obviously has a big influence on female condition and then how much investment she then has in, t- in her eggs. Thank you. And... Um- We've got a, another question here, which is about nest boxes in, in particular. I'm not sure if they're, they're thinking about nest boxes that may be being used in, in conservation projects or more about perhaps the, the birds in their own garden. But they ask, does a nest box affect the temperature causing the eggs to fail? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I mean, I don't know, but um, it's very feasible that inside obviously an, a nest box you're going to have a kind of microclimate which is different to the climate outside of that nest box um, and I don't know of any studies that have directly compared for example um, nests of the same species that are in a uh, nest box and that are in a kind of natural most most birds that would go into a nest box would probably choose some kind of cavity so you, there, there would be quite an interesting comparison to make there. There was a recent um, study on zebra finches, um, but the but all of those were inside nest boxes, um, and uh, it was during a heat wave in Australia, and they had really high levels of um, 
of egg mortality um, during that heat wave. Now, all of those clutches were inside nest boxes. So, um, and you see, you haven't got that comparison to wild nests, but I imagine that the, the nest box may have exacerbated that, that kind of hot environment. You can imagine how kind of mm. stuffy and, and hot it would be in there uh, during like a 45 degree Celsius heat wave. So, um, so yeah, I think it could definitely have an effect. Thank you, Nicola. Um, Jen, I've got another question that's come through for, for you, which is, are factors that impact the population on the birds you research um, dependent on um, conservation levels? So I think what they're, they're trying to say is pred predation is the biggest factor now, but is habitat loss what brought them so, so low in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we know for a fact that, you know, the, the reason a lot of these populations have declined and are, are now at these low levels is because of habitat loss or, or changes in the quality of their habitat. So intensification of agriculture, uh, those sorts of factors. And, and actually habitat is the first thing we do in conservation. You know, we have a we have a sort of a sequence of things that we do first. And the first thing you always do is get the habitat right. There's absolutely no point doing any sort of predator interventions or anything like that, unless you've got the habitat right for the species in the first place. Once you've got the habitat right, you can usually see, you know, population responding, population, um, you know, responding to the habitat, starting to breed there. And then you start to pick up what, what some of the other threats are. So yeah, we, yeah, habitat is absolutely uh, the first thing that you do. Thank you. Um, I've got a quick follow up for Gary and Patricia, which is does the artificial incubation. Oh, and it's just moved up the up the list. It's, it's a, a fast, fast moving one. Oh, no. Where's it gone? <laughs> oh, it might. It may even have been removed already. Um, it was something to do with incubation and in, I think improving hatchability. But I'm really sorry. It's it's disappeared off my list, so I can't I can't ask you, which is such a shame. Um, so instead, um, oh, hang on, I think I might have it on my screen here. Here we go. Does the artificial incubation improve the hatchability? So, so if I'll just answer this one instead of going on my own. <laughs> so um, it depends on the context. So artificial incubation doesn't uh, necessarily improve hatchability compared to uh, natural incubation but in a lot of species you can't have natural incubation because you have such high rates of predation for example for example in the godwits or in the black stilts so you have such high levels of predation in the wild that if you left those eggs they would just disappear so actually the loss of uh the, you know, the lower hatchability that you then experience during artificial incubation definitely upsets uh, the survival probability later on. So you use, uh, you know, head starting like Jen does or, or for the black stilts to get those eggs over that kind of predation hump. So then you can have a higher probability of then establishing the population. Fantastic. Thank you. And then one final question um because i would really like to know the answer to this um which is how common are double yoker eggs in nature is anyone able to answer that <laughs> not sure not something you come across often i i don't know but patricia you did find one once in hee hee right i did but that was just the one time we've had well we found um twins so twin uh, embryos, which died during development, but that, that's only been one record in, you know, mm. since 1995. So I have found sure. a, a couple of double yolk of zebra finch eggs when when working with a captive population of zebra finches. Um, but yeah, in the wild, who knows? Yeah. And my experience is, you know, you do see that in some domesticated species, but such as domestic poultry, where they're bred specifically for egg production. And you would probably, I wouldn't be surprised that you've seen it in zebra finches as well, which are essentially as a domesticated species. But um, in captivity, working with a wide range of, you know, natural wild species, uh, you know, I've not come across any double yoking, yet double yolk eggs for, for a lot of the sort of wild species that we, we work with, where we, we get to see the eggs quite regularly. So. Mm. 
Okay, well, thank you ever so much, everyone. I'm afraid that does bring us to the end of tonight's event, but it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for all of your presentations. It's been a brilliant insight into your work. And thank you to everyone who um, has been joining us online this evening and for your fantastic questions as well. I'm going to share my screen with you one final time because at the very beginning um, of the event tonight I did mention that we'd really like to hear your feedback about tonight's events um, what you enjoyed perhaps suggestions for future events things we could improve so please if you have um, a moment it will only take a few minutes do complete our survey monkey form the address is www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event seven. That's www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ZSL event seven. Hopefully you've enjoyed this this evening's event. Um, it is one of many events that we run at ZSL. So if you'd like to know more, please do visit our website. Our next upcoming events are in June and July. Next month, we're going to be looking at life in the cold and marine research in Greenland. And then in July, we're going to be talking about biobanking for conservation. And to make sure that you don't miss any of those events in the future, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to know more about ZSL's work, ways you can help and support us, and ways that you can get involved, then do look on our website, which is www.zsl.org for more information there. And there you will also be able to find links to our Wild Science podcast, where you can catch up on all of our previous events. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>